Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 24 playthrough of the Buffalo Wings. And I anticipate that this is going to be a relatively short episode. We're sitting here on the 4th of July and uh, we were just swept on the road by the Mets. So a half game lead in the NL East has turned into a two and a half game deficit for us. That said, we're still up four games on the final wild card spot, so we would be firmly in the playoffs for a 17th consecutive season if the year were to end today. And the reason that I'm thinking it might be a relatively short episode is that I don't think we're going to do too much before the trade deadline. Kind of took a quick look at the end of our last episode at the players who are out there on the trade block. Potentially upgrading shortstop was something I had thought about doing. Mike Whitehead is hitting 261, which is fine. And he's basically been a slightly below average defensive shortstop this year. In a perfect world, I'd like somebody stronger there now. But there's not really any attractive options on the trade block. And the options that are out there that might be materially more attractive than Whitehead are extremely expensive to obtain. So I'm leaning towards moving forward with him for this year as our shortstop. We'll keep checking in and that can certainly change. And I'm kind of feeling that even though we are struggling a bit at the top of our order this year. We had Deshaun Seifu, who's having a brutal year leading off. About a month ago, we replaced him with Edgar Canales, who's batting second for us against right-handed pitching. And he hasn't done much this year offensively either. And at this point, my thought is that the top prospect in our system, Jim Riker is going to be somebody that we're bringing up less than two months from now, assuming that he's healthy. And if we do make it into the playoffs, we are going to plug him right into our lineup against right-handed pitching and probably also against left-handed pitching. But against right-handed pitching, particularly as someone who I have a lot of confidence looking at his rankings will be better than Canales has been this year offensively and will be more productive than an aging Deshaun Seifu. So I feel that we've got some help for our offense coming. It's likely to just come from our minor league system rather than through a trade. And we did, between the last episode and this episode offline, make one minor trade we picked up the left-handed reliever kevin hale uh you may remember him because uh, he is a guy who was in our organization we traded him away last year um as part of the deal last off season that picked us up the young outfielder Tim Boston who's having a uh, pretty solid year for us. Uh, we were hoping we might not need Hale as a lefty. He wasn't on the trade block but it wasn't extremely expensive for us to pick him up. Uh, the reason we were hoping we might not need him is that we had a uh, Mr. Drawn coming back from an injury, Sean Drawn, but as we talked about an episode or two ago, he came back from a pretty serious injury, not looking as a shell of himself, but not looking as a necessarily big-time major league reliever. So that opened up a need for us, in my mind, to add a third left-hander into our pitching staff or onto our pitching staff. And Hale fit the bill with his solid ratings and particularly the fact that he's really good against left-handed batters. And he didn't cost us too much. Um, had to give up a minor league reliever, Phil Brubaker, who um, doesn't seem like a 
big time prospect to me. Um, he is a good leader, so I think uh, Boston wanted that in their clubhouse. Uh, but I don't view Brew Baker as being a big part of our future. So the fact we were able to get a pretty solid lefty for him made it all worthwhile to me. So bringing Hale on board uh, meant that we did have to make a move and uh, didn't have anyone who obviously needed to be sent down, but Juan Castaneda, who's been solid for us this year in his first year for us with a 3.16 ERA over 25 and two-thirds innings, is someone who still had options. Uh, so the 32-year-old is going to be down in Albany. And I don't know that we really need to do too much else pitching-wise because uh, we've got some talent down there. We actually have Jorge Carrillo. You may remember him. He was our longtime pitcher who we let leave as a free agent several years back. Uh, we picked him up uh, not too long ago as a minor league free agent. Don't view him as being a big-time part of our future. But Juan Castaneda uh, certainly will be back up in September to help us. And then we have three pretty interesting starting pitchers in AAA right now. Jim Coles, Eric Fisher, and Solano Toselli. Uh, Jim Coles, 23-year-old, who was a first-round pick four, uh, three years ago, 7-6 and six with a 474 ERA. Uh, but his profile suggests that he could be a pretty useful major leaguer. He's also got a captain personality, which we could use next year. So he'll probably be up in September and likely up for good next year. Eric Fisher, a second round pick from 2038, has kind of taken longer to move up through the organization. But he's 10 and 1 this year with a 311 ERA, his first trip to AAA. And then Solano Tesselli, an international free agent signing from 2038, 6 and 5 with a 374 ERA. Uh, don't know that any of these guys are true top-of-the-rotation type pitchers, uh, but think that they could all be three, four, five type starters or certainly useful in the bullpen. And in the case of Toselli, that does give us another potential left-handed arm, and he's a little better against lefties than he is against righties. So feel that between those three starters down in AAA – as well as Castaneda, who we've added, uh, dumped down there recently, that uh, we've got pitching help if we need it. We've got batting help on the way with Reichert. So uh, we'll keep looking for a middle infielder, but I tend to think someone who's going to be an obvious upgrade to what we have is probably more expensive than we can afford. And we've made it to the All-Star break with a 52-36 and 36 record. We are in a flat-footed tie with the New York Mets for the National League East and also in a flat-footed tie with the Mets for the best record in the National League. Uh, so hopefully if we can play a little better in the second half of the year than we played in the first half-plus of the year, uh, we'll be in a situation where at the very least we might have home field advantage, at least until we get to a World Series. Taking a look at the batting leaders here at the All-Star break, uh, nobody on the Buffalo Wings uh, among the batting leaders. Alexis Barajas, who could be in his final go-round with us, 11-1 uh, and one record, leads the National League and wins. And our closer, Joe Scott, is second in the National League in saves. Uh, wouldn't be shocked to have uh, both of those players on the All-Star team. Barajas also just won the 200th game of his career, uh, 200 and 102, with a 330 career ERA. He's been a cornerstone of uh, what we've accomplished here with Buffalo over the last decade plus member of all three of our world championship teams and uh we can get a little preview he uh was named an all-star again this year although uh, we haven't checked the official list yet uh our young third baseman ramiro medina uh was just named the national league player of the week 
Uh, his batting average is up to 268, and he's got 20 homers and 51 ribbies. Really happy to have him on board. We picked him up in a trade with Pittsburgh two off seasons ago. I uh, think he's a guy who does everything reasonably well. Pretty good fielder for a third baseman, an above average bat, a little bit of speed. He can bunt. Uh, he's already got almost as many home runs this year uh, at the age of 25 as he did last year in his full first full season in Buffalo. And he's also jacked up his batting average by over 30 points uh, to put up a 134 WRC plus for us. So happy uh, to have Medina on board and doing well, uh, particularly over the past week. Take a look now at the all-star game rosters for our Buffalo Wings. Uh, we already know that Alexis Barajas uh, was named an all-star this year. Floyd Auclair, our excellent stopper, uh, an all-star for the first time in his career. 7-2 and two record with 19 holds and a ridiculous 123 strikeouts in a pretty ridiculous for a reliever 80 and a third innings pitched thus far this year. Uh, that 179 ERA and 1.65 Sierra are both pretty impressive, as is his 49 FIP minus. Joe Scott, as we anticipated, also named to the All-Star team uh, as well. This is the fifth All-Star appearance for Scott, who is a two-time Mariano Rivera Award winner. 5-5 five and five with 28 saves, 62 strikeouts, and 47 and two-thirds innings this year for Scott. See if we have any position players named to the All-Star team as well. Daniel Rojas, uh, who like Alexis Barajas, quite possibly in his final year in Buffalo. And uh, he is named an All-Star for the first time in his four seasons in Buffalo hitting 276, 17 homers, 48 ribbies, has put up a very impressive 158 WRC plus here in mid-July. And will there be any other Buffalo Wings on the All-Star team? And it looks like that's it. So nice to see Rojas, Scott, Auclair, and Barajas recognized for their fine seasons for All-Stars for the Buffalo Wings here in 2044. And it's been a weird path for our Buffalo Wings since the All-Star break. Uh, we took three out of four on the road in Washington. Then we were swept at home in a four-game series by the Marlins before heading back on the road where we swept Toronto. And uh, we combined for 44 runs and uh, only allowed nine runs in that three-game sweep against the Blue Jays. So as we sit here with one week left before the All-Star break, uh, we're two and a half games up on the Mets 586 winning percentage, uh, the best in the National League. We're a game and a half better than the Cubs in terms of our overall record. Uh, so not feeling like we have to be desperate. We're going to continue to peruse the trade market and see if maybe there's something that makes sense. But as I mentioned, with the depth of pitching we have in AAA and the great young bat in Riker that we have waiting there to help us, and the fact that we did make a trade for the left-handed pitcher, Hale. The only real thing I'm maybe interested in is a big-time middle infielder. And I just don't know that there's going to be one available. And if one is available, my hunch is the price is going to be more, that we're more than we're willing to pay. But we'll keep looking at things offline, but uh, we could be nearing the end of a relatively quiet trade deadline for the Buffalo Wings this year in 2044. And as we sit here a week before the trade deadline, uh, I don't think we're going to get anything done. Uh, see a lot of familiar names on the trade block. Our former catcher Walt Miller, uh, former outfielder Mike Heiner, 
And we thought about making a deal for Tim Ho, our former starting shortstop, who's got a bit better range than Whitehead does at this point. But when I look at what Hull has done as the starting shortstops for the Pirates uh, this year, he's put up one-tenth of a win above replacement, whereas Whitehead been, has been a full win above replacement here more than halfway through the season. Obviously, neither is spectacular, but Hull is fragile physically, and with his offensive limitations, hasn't been as productive as Whitehead has. So we're not going to pursue that. Uh, several other more familiar names, Shamar Jenneret, nearing the end of uh, his brilliant career. Our old buddy, Joe Nabin Jan Johnson Gallagher, and Joe Edwards are all also on the trade block. Don't see any need in going for them. One guy that we were very intrigued by is our old uh, two-way player Juan Estrada the left-handed starting pitcher who's still a pretty darn effective pitcher he's still got that captain personality seven and six this year with a 4.84 ERA and he's also still a useful hitter against uh, right-handed pitching in particular, hitting 298 this year and 309 at-bats. He could definitely uh, probably help our offense a bit as a number two hitter against right-handed pitching where he was for all those many years batting behind Deshaun Seifu. But even though he's in the final year of his contract, uh, the Nationals are just looking for a ton for him right now. We may revisit things in a few days, but uh, for a rental, his price is incredibly high. Kind of a weird guy on the market, 28-year-old left fielder Mike Whitman. And you can see he's got a disruptive personality poor leadership and poor work ethic, which probably explains it. But he's a 28-year-old who's making $32.5 million for the Padres. You can see he's a perennial all-star. Uh, he's also won a silver slugger, a rookie of the year, and he's been the MVP of a couple of playoff series, having a really good year with a 128 WRC+. Plus hitting close to 300 with 17 homers and 57 ribbies. But apparently the uh, Padres have decided that his uh, negative personality traits and his disruptive personality likely mean that they aren't going to try to extend him when uh, he's a free agent at the end of this year. So they've put him on the trade block as well, and he would certainly be an interesting bat to add to our lineup but the uh, price not surprisingly for Mr. Whitman is also prohibitive. Um, right now just to put Juan Estrada into perspective uh, the only guy in our organization who we can uh, trade for him straight up is our ace Jim Lance uh, eight and six with a 310 ERA this year set to make over 13 million next year uh, but we've still got his rights for another few seasons and he's about a decade younger than Juan Estrada so as much as I think that uh, Juan Estrada would be a nice add for us and as I said we'll we'll investigate it again over the coming days in case maybe his price gets lower I tend to think that there's not going to be a trade for us here in this last week of July And as we sit here on July 30th, uh, closing in on the trade deadline, we're 62-41, and 41, four games up on the Expos now, four and a half up on the Mets. Uh, we've won seven in a row at this point. And I don't think, barring an injury over the next 24 hours, that we're going to make any trades. I did check back in on Juan Estrada, and still the only way to get him is to give up Jim Lance. 
Similarly, uh, the excellent young outfielder with the uh, not-so-great personality, Mike Whitman. The only way to get him was to include Jim Lance. I even checked in on the shortstop, uh, Toby Golston, who we looked at last offseason, who signed a two-year, $19 million deal with the Yankees. And uh, they were requesting either uh, Jim Lance or um, Reichert, the prize of our organization for Golston. So uh, the prices are just incredibly high. As I said, unless we suffer some real significant injury in the next 24 hours, likely will be no deals uh, as the trade deadline approaches here for the Buffalo Wings. And we've made it to August. Our long winning streak was stopped. Uh, so we're 63 and 42 right now, a 600 winning percentage. Three games up on the Expos for the NL East. Three games up on the Expos for the best record in the National League. And we are in a flat-footed tie with both the Guardians and the Royals for the best record in baseball. So we've been playing much better over the last couple of months. Taking a look at our team statistics, uh, we were 20-6 and six in June. And we followed that up with a 17 and 10 record in July. Our 63 and 42 record is actually three games worse than Pythagorean expectations. And we have been scoring an insane amount of runs recently. We're up to fourth in the National League in runs scored. Uh, you may remember about a month ago, we were still 11th in the National League in runs scored. So we have had some big offensive days over the last uh, month or so and as has often been the case we are first in the national league in runs allowed and you can see we are uh, in the top handful of every pitching category third in defensive efficiency first in zone rating third in stolen bases third in base running uh it's a pretty solid roster at this point uh didn't feel the need to make any dramatic changes and to pay exorbitant prices for rentals and as i've talked about during this episode with reichert potentially on the way as well as the good young pitchers we have in triple a feel like we'll be getting some help in september regardless and hopefully it'll be some help that can uh, aid us in october and see reichert right now uh banged up with some hamstring tightness only two days away um, from returning so it doesn't seem to be a major problem there he has been as dan patrick used to say incorrectly back in the early days of sports center reichert has been en fuego for the month or so that he's been with Albany hitting 377, 12 homers and 26 ribbies and 106 at bats, a uh, ridiculous 1.237 OPS and 209 WRC plus. Uh, he certainly has the batting ratings that indicate he is ready for the majors and uh, barring any major injuries, he will be making his major league debut on September 1st. Uh, we noted last episode we're kind of training him up at first base at this point, and uh, he's about as proficient as, as he's going to be at first base, left field, and right field, uh, which unfortunately is not incredibly proficient. Uh, but we look at his ratings, and particularly against right-handed pitching, and think that uh, the eventual addition of Reichert into our lineup is... Uh, will be a very positive thing for us. Juan Toledo, uh, our second best prospect, is hitting 253 with eight homers and 95 at-bats since we moved him up to high A ball. And uh, Danny Black uh, having a choppy year, 8-12 and 12 with a 571 ERA for high A Jamestown as well. So some incredible performances from our minor leaguers like Reichert, some pretty rough runs from Danny Black, 
and uh, Juan Toledo is kind of in the middle, but it's nice to see him uh, finally coming along a bit as a prospect. We rank second out of 32 teams in the power rankings, so feeling pretty good about what this season may become as we sit here on August 1st. And before we finish the episode, we'll check in and see how the living legend Deshaun Seifu is doing now that he is no longer an everyday player for us. And uh, Seifu at this point has raised his batting average a bit to 226 in 270 at-bats. Uh, does have eight doubles and four triples this year. And he's 19 of 22 running. So he's actually been uh, a little better over the last couple of months since uh, he lost his full-time job. Taking a look at his uh, batting splits here, uh, you can see he actually hit 306 during the month of July. Uh, it was only 49 at-bats, uh, but he did get two more triples. And uh, he's got 196 triples in his career. It's hard to imagine he's going to pick up four more, uh, given that he's only playing regularly against left-handed pitching, and he conceivably might only be starting another 10, 12, maybe 15 games over the course of this season. But he had two last month. All he does is need to duplicate that in uh, August and September, and he'll get to uh, 200 triples for his career in what I am anticipating uh, will fi probably be the uh, final season of an incredible career. Uh, you can see he's unplayable in the field at this point at the age of 40. He still does have uh, pretty good speed, which is kind of insane. Uh, but his contact is pretty much average now. His gap power a little below average. He's never had much home run power. He's still an Iron Man, and he's still fast, and he's still got that captain personality and is a great influence in our clubhouse. But uh, Mr. Seifu's career is, I believe at this point, nearing an end in his 19th season as a major leaguer. And as we think about the next two months of the regular season, as we sit here on August 1st, uh, given that we're up three games in the National League East, uh, the goal is certainly to win the NL East at the very least. And given that we are in a three-way tie for the best record in baseball, uh, certainly would think that there's a decent probability that we'll end up with the best record in the National League and possibly home field advantage through for throughout the playoffs or for at least as long as we're alive in the playoffs if we're uh, able to finish up with the best record in baseball. So certainly goal number one is to make the playoffs. Uh, goal number two is to be completely healthy for the playoffs. And then the third goal will be some of those more ambitious goals like winning the division, having the best record in the NL, and having the best record in baseball. And we'll find out how we do with those goals in our next episode. Until then, thanks so much for watching and hope you have a great day.